Good evening, I'm Vaughan Smith. I'm the founder of the Frontline Club. And um, I'm really excited by tonight. Um, and I'd like to express my enormous gratitude to John Godfrey Morris, um, who I know you're all really excited to see. Um, it's not the first time John's been here. Um, he comes here quite frequently, he's talked before, and we're very grateful, very grateful indeed. Because John happens to be 97. Um, but these aren't like 97 normal years, it seems to me. They're 97 pretty packed years of stuff that, you know, um, it's not just a single life, really. It's a multitude of lives that he's managed to fit in of any normal person. And so it's a great privilege. But uh, I do want to point out that the photographs you see in this room, the photographs in the hall, the photographs in the restaurant, are very much a product um, of, of John's. Um, he, he led the initiative and encouraged everybody to give them to us. Um, and um, we're eternally grateful because um, they're wonderful. Thank you very much, John, and, and, and welcome. Um, and um, I'm now going to hand over um, to Robert Pledge, who's a co-founder of Contact Press Images and is going to run the show from here. Thank you very much. You've got, no, you've got, one. You've got one. I don't need to give you that. <laughs> sure. Well, thank you. Thank you for this warm welcome to... John, nothing to it. I call him Sir John, you know, but, that's, uh, but um, I think we're very happy to be here because indeed, do you hear me? Yeah. yeah, okay. Indeed, John has taught here a number of times, but he was always here as um, a historian of the medium, as somebody who has been involved in photography as a picture editor. Um, he started off at Life magazine and then went on to uh, work with Ladies Home Journal, with Magnum for a good number of years, of which he was the first director, then the Washington Post, the New York Times, and then the correspondent in Paris for the National Geographic. That's quite an amazing career, and he is undoubtedly one of the most knowledgeable people in the field. Um, he can speak about all these great photographers whose names are familiar to you, from Robert Kappa to Cathy Bresson to W. Gene Smith and so on and so forth, Don McCullen, et cetera, et cetera. But we didn't know until about a couple of years ago that John not only could speak about photography, but he had been a photographer himself for a very short period of time, for less than four weeks in his life. <laughs> this came as a revelation, maybe to him in some ways, because when we spoke about it, I got to see his photographs uh, a little bit by chance. Uh, they were sitting around, he was showing me something else. I saw those pictures, I asked him who the hell had taken them. He said, well, uh, I did. Uh, there were only five or six of them, or seven maybe. and. I said, but I had no idea you had ever been a photographer. He said, I never was a photographer. I never was a photographer until I took those pictures, and I've never been a photographer since I took these pictures. And that was over that very, very short period of time, but not just an ordinary uh, period of time. It was six weeks or so after D-Day. John was then picture editor in London for Life magazine in charge of the coverage of what was going on on the Western Front um, at that time, and it was pretty big, uh, of course. Um, and he is the one who would edit and make sure that the film would go through the military censorship and on to New York, where it would be edited, then published in Life magazine on a weekly basis uh, with the great photographers, the Robert Kappa, the Ralph Morse, the Tom Landry, the Churchill, the Sherman, the George Roger, there was a Brit amongst them. Um, and, um, but once all the action had moved to the other side of the ocean, John felt a little lonely and um, a little bored maybe in London and very curious really about what was happening on the other side of the channel, in Normandy, in Brittany, where fierce fighting went on for weeks and a few months until, uh, no, for several months until August, basically, of that year. So he managed to convince 
his editors in New York that there was a terrible need for him to go to Normandy or to, 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 to the other side and coordinate uh, the uh, photography pool um, and, uh, and make sure that everything was running fine. And he, for some mysterious reason that he still hasn't explained to me as of today, he grabbed a camera, uh, 120 minute, uh, a Roliflex, uh, 120 min uh, millimeter film, um, and took it with him and, and, and took some pictures. He shot, I believe, 168 images over less than four weeks. 14 rolls of film were shot. That's very little. I mean, in this digital age, you shoot 168 images per minute. <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, it's quite interesting uh, when you think of it, the sheer numbers. So 168. But John never thought of himself as a photographer and uh, never thought he was a photographer. So he didn't take care of his film. You know, he, he, he did to his film exactly what he told photographers never to do, which is not to find them properly, not to caption them, not to, you know, none, they were there sitting in and had been sitting for 69 years. I think he'd looked at them every now and then. Somebody would look at them with him occasionally and nothing ever happened to them. So when I saw them, I was quite uh, bemused and I said, well, um, I think that we have an exhibition here, John. He didn't believe me. He thought I was pulling his leg. And, but we did an exhibition that got great acclaim at uh, a festival in France, in Perpignan, called Visa pour l'image, which is the festival of photojournalism, in, certainly in Europe, maybe in the world, etc. And John got tremendous acclaim from his peers, from critics, and, and his story was splashed all over the newspapers, everywhere. So, once that happened, I said, well, maybe, um, maybe it's time we do the book. This time he took it a little more seriously. So this is what we're going to be speaking about tonight, John Morris. Not the picture editor, not the historian of photography, but John Morris, the photographer. And he will tell us some stories. And of course, he'll take us to some other places, uh, I'm sure, and has different messages that John would you like to add to what I've said and correct anything wrong I might have said? I, <clears throat> well, actually, I'm competing with myself at this very minute. According to Christiane Amanpour, I'm on television. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I spent uh, an hour with Christiane Amanpour in the, in the CNN studio yesterday afternoon. And as a result, is a seven-minute piece, which is supposed to run start at seven o'clock. It may be finished by now, but um, if you're lucky, you can see it later somehow. They, oh, they, they'll run it over again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah they do. At any rate, you might at least show the book. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this early? Well, okay. So this this is the book, as you can all read the title, Quelque part en France which translate as somewhere in France. It might sound a strange title, but it isn't, because John wrote letters from France, and other people did, did that had to go through military censorship. But they, no one was allowed to reveal where they were writing for, from. So it was from somewhere in France. And I thought that would make a great title. and. Uh, that is the title of the book. I have learned since that there is another book called Somewhere in France <laughs> that came out about the same time. And that <laughs> is, and that, and, no, 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 but it's really interesting, and about World War I, the Great War, oh. because that is where that expression comes from. It goes back to the First World War. Um, and, uh, and a woman historian wrote this book that is called Somewhere in France also. So, uh, that's, that's a good sign. So um, maybe what we should do is show you the images, show you the book uh, quickly, and then we'll have a bit of a conversation and 
hopefully even better than that, you'll be asking questions to John and getting great answers, I'm sure. Um, is that okay with you? Yes, sir. So let's, uh, is there anything you wanted to? That's, that's perfect. Uh, I know you, you wanted to see uh, the Christian Hanapur. You don't mind if I turn my back to the screen? <laughs> yes. Well, yes, I had the advantage of having a computer on my, it's a laptop, so I put it on my lap, uh, which makes mm -hmm. sense. Lights off. Um, and uh, we're going to run this. It will last 15 minutes. I, 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 the image will run a, a few seconds each, and I will try and speak over them and give you some context. Um, I do it that way so I don't speak more than 15 minutes. Otherwise, we'd be here tomorrow morning. Uh, well, you might not, but uh, um, fine. So we just get started. Uh, this is the cover you just saw. We hope that there will be an English edition for it uh, um, sometime in the near future. Well, now I can't find my little cursor. Now here we go. Where is it? Oh, here we go. Yes. Now, this is the team of people, of photographers John was working with. John is the man in the middle and the first row crouching here with to his Right, Ralph Morse, who is 97 years old and living in Florida today. Um, all the other photographers uh, have passed away over the years. Um, and maybe we'll just go back one second and introduce them. Um, standing in the back is Tom Landry, I believe. Uh, Bob Landry. The, right? Bob Landry. Bob Landry, Bob. sorry. Uh, on, yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Denning. Um, uh, George Roger with a cigarette in his mouth. Is it? It's Churchill? Frank Churchill. Frank Churchill. And of course, uh, with the raincoat, Robert Kappa. Crouching is Sherman uh, to, um, to your left. Right. These are the six photographers who are part of the Life magazine coverage of you know, the Western Front in in during World War II. And they were all part of this pool of photographers, or most of them were part of the pool of 16 photographers who had been accredited by the Supreme Allied Forces to cover um, the, uh, the events, that, the landing and D-Day, and, and of course, what would follow. Um, so those are some of the Picture, this is one of the pictures I saw that when uh, when I when John uh, and I met and uh, dis re discovered personally discovered those images. It was the first time I had seen them. Had seen them, and um, he also showed me this envelope. And this is in an envelope of, uh, where that has different stamps on it, as you can see, um, including um, that of the. Uh, Censorship. Oh my God! Where's the little cursor? I can't find it anymore. Um, I want to stop this one second. Um, this envelope has a stamp with a date on it, and the date is June 6, 1944, which is a which is D-Day, and that is an amazing coincidence. A letter that John sent to his wife, Bobby a day earlier that went through military censorship then. Um, every image, every letter that was sent out had the stamp of uh, uh, the censors, stamps such as this one, which is on the back of all of John's uh, photographs or contact sheets. And you can see the dates August and December, which means John sent his film out to be processed much later than uh, when uh, the events uh, took place. These are some of the contact sheets uh, that he kept. Uh, these are the ones that remained basically intact and for which there were negatives. Out of this single contact sheet, five images will be in the book. Um, out of this uh, contact sheet, uh, I think 
three, four images will be part of the book. So John shot 14 rolls of film equivalent to this. And um, we were able to put a book together, which means that the images were overall very impressive. These are all the towns, places that John visited over that four-month, uh, four-week period, or less than four-week period, in Normandy and Brittany, and where he took, in most cases, photographs. He would take photographs primarily when there were no other photographs around, and he felt that while there were important things that maybe he should just make a note of. He went there with full uh, official credentials, including one given by the French Free Forces at the Gold's um, uh, organization in London. Uh, this is his ID card. He never signed it. Um, he, um, he sent nine letters to his wife during that period of time, something that we discovered much later. Uh, letters that he would type because on any typewriter he could find, on any piece of paper he could find, and you can see that it's quite varied. And when uh, John told me about this, he said uh, he indicated that these um, letters contained quite a bit of information that would, could be useful, locations, uh, where he had been, and as I asked to see them, he said, well, not before I've edited them, and sometimes he would handwrite them, not before I've edited them. I said, why would you want to edit them? He said, because they're very personal. I said, but if they're personal, you can't edit them. We need it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we had, I must say, Pat, uh, Pat Trockney, um, uh, John's uh, partner, uh, uh, companion, uh, convince him to let me uh, have these letters and to use them as they were. Now, we'll look at the photographs. Um, there are 50 of them in the book, 50 out of, selected out of 125, 28 images that had survived because some negatives were lost, some contact sheets were cut up and um, disappeared. Most of the pictures we see here were uh, from negatives. Some were uh, scanned in very high resolution from the contact sheets themselves when the negative didn't exist. And you might or not notice it. The quality varies a little bit. The images are shown as they were registered on the film. They're uncropped. They all have these borders around with John's, this is John himself, picture taken by, uh, I'm not sure who, uh, Chauchel maybe, or somebody who was another photographer. But John's pictures bear his um, initials, JM, the wall of film, the number, because until the 50s, 120 millimeter film did not have numbers embedded in the film. So it was all done manually. This is a Dein Abbas inspired image. Uh, <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't know uh, Dein Abbas then. I mean, it, it, a small town called Montebourg that had been dreadfully destroyed by, basically by the uh, US and British uh, Air Force. Um, <clears throat> and John went to these places and photographed them in, in the in a rather random way, as soon as something caught his attention and he thought it was noteworthy. And he accumulated these images in places, images that are so very different from those of the war <laughs> photographers, the war photographers we are all familiar with, the Robert Cabot, the Ralph Moss, the other people who were covering the events who were more concerned about the action. He photographed prisoners, the first German prison he saw who were terribly young, 17, 18, 19, <coughs> who were taken away. This is a Salgado-inspired Sierra Pallada image, uh, um, <coughs> and a black driver taking these superior race uh, 
representative's uh, way as prisoners was something quite amazing. This is one of Don McCullin's favorite images by, by uh, and, and because of the sky, of course, and the darkness of it. But John was, saw things and registered things that most photographers did not. This is John in a, a, a foxhole, um, photographed by one of his colleagues, the photographers. We had quite a bit of discussion over this photograph um, along the way, uh, because John thought it was a little out of focus and maybe shouldn't be in there, but uh, if they didn't, I think he now likes the image better. Um, <coughs> There were fierce battles going on, and um, John, who had the rank of captain, like all the fine correspondents, uh, <coughs> was able to be driven in a jeep to the different locations as towns were being liberated or had been liberated, and uh, therefore was close to the action, usually there the day or the day after, or a couple of days after things had happened, and therefore recording um, scenes that other photographers probably weren't because they had moved on to some other place. Um, a British war correspondent here at the Lyon d'Or Hotel that still exists in Bayeux, where John spent his first night, and <clears throat> little everyday scenes in the French countryside in small towns. He even wrote a letter, uh, a telegram to his wife a telegram he wrote in French. It's a very, I, I'm not going to translate it now, but it's a very cute letter that was uh, a telegram that was never sent out because the postal services were not working. Mail service did not exist then. John Morris invented the selfie. <laughs> <laughs> we think it's something new. It isn't. With uh, a Rolleiflex camera, he took these pictures of himself, I think that's quite, but Robert Kappa took this picture of him um, at the Mont Saint-Michel. Um, and uh, there, there's a piece of video actually showing Robert Kappa taking this image. Uh, John happened to arrive also in a major city like Rennes, the capital of Brittany, as it was being liberated. And this is the situation where he photographed most abundantly, I think, a dozen images over the few hours he was there, which is quite a lot. And he he saw you know, the change in administration, the new, the appointed mayor who was replacing the one who had been a collaborator, the Germans, the uh, Americans taking German prisoners, uh, um, the regrouping of uh, these uh, African forces of the French army that had been kept in camps around Rennes and they reconstituted their battalions and went on uh, all the way to Berlin. And we did an exhibition exactly at this place with John's images just a few months ago. We'll speak about that later. Um, he was up there in City Hall. There were There were basically no correspondence, a few photographers, but very few writers there. So John wrote a very long dispatch uh, that he sent to Life magazine that did not use it then because there was so much going on, but Life mag Time magazine uh, used part of it and we were able to retrieve the original document that was sitting in the files of the University of Chicago where John had donated much of his um, work, fortunately not the photographs, um, because John graduated in political science from the University of Chicago. They were sometimes together with Robert Kappa, whom he photographs here. The grease marked with the red um, pencil were done by John. And other times John was on his own as a photographer, like in Dol de Bretagne, a small town that had just been liberated. Um, you know, every great war has a great kiss picture. Everybody knows the Eisenstadt photograph that's on the wall here. But John, I think, uh, 
has outdone uh, Eisenstadt because he got the, the, the KISS picture where the events were taking place and not in New York City. Um, there was much turmoil in France. There were many things happening. Uh, there were displaced people because of the bombings who were you know, roaming or, or, or traveling on, on the roads from one place to another. But some semblance of order was restored with French and American military police uh, took charge of, of uh, things. Uh, battles went on, in, particularly in Brittany, that uh, Robert Kappa covered, and John was there too. Prisoners were, German prisoners surrendered after much resistance. Um, John was there, photographed uh, Robert Kappa, photographing uh, um, German prisoners uh, surrendering and um, was caught in himself in a hairy situation where there was some shooting going on and uh, he took some unreasonable chances himself. But um, it also gave him the opportunity to make the only photograph of his that was published from that take seven years after the war in uh, uh, this 16, 15, 16 year old German prisoner um, who surrendered and uh, John would write about him uh, in, uh, in pageant magazine. I will show you actually the spread um, speaking about the face of his enemy and describing um, his feelings about it at that time. Um, these are the pictures, these are the letters. Uh, I will show you a few additional uh, bits and pieces that are, I think, interesting. This is the article published in Pageant that I was able to buy on eBay just recently for $28. Um, it's a very short, beautiful text written by John with his photograph, published in 1952, and that was the first time any of John's images would be published, and basically the only picture that really was published. This little town that uh, I mentioned earlier, Montebourg, we had great difficulties identifying in terms of finding the locations because John didn't always remember uh, what uh, these uh, venues were. Well, um, we called upon local historians and uh, people uh, who once sent us this amazing postcard from the 1930s that had been vaguely colorized. And if you look carefully at the five buildings in a row here and the chimneys, etc., uh, you'll realize that it is indeed the same town and shot almost from the same angle. And it allowed us, three days before we went to press, to correct uh, the uh, caption in uh, the book. Same situation here where there was the feeling that maybe this was taken in Rennes in Brittany. Another historian sent us this image of a building and if you look at the port and the, the little sculpture above the, 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 the doorway, it is the same. And indeed, it is a small town in Normandy called Valogne that is quite a few uh, hundred miles away from Rennes. Um, it was much fun to investigate, uh, to, 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 to try and retrieve um, all this information. Uh, and, uh, and I think probably also quite exciting for John to realize that he had been to places, the names of which he did not remember. They were exotic names. Uh, we even found the names of these three after the book was published of these three young men who were 16 and 17 years old. Two of them joined the, the forces, went all the way to Berlin. They all passed away in the last few years. We were not able to meet them, but John met their children and grandchildren. We know the name of three of them. And this would be the cover of the book if indeed we were able to get it published in English, which we're hoping to do in uh, the near future. And uh, that is uh, it in terms of the uh, 
images. we go. I'm, John, oh. is there anything I forgot? Anything? We forgot, you forgot to identify the mayor's desk. There's, there was a, a photograph of the interior of the office of the mayor of Wren, uh, which I uh, ascended, I, I bounded up the stairs the morning after the liberation, and I found the, the mayor's desk with two empty wine glasses sitting on it and a man sitting behind the desk. And I said, are you the mayor? And he said, no. He said, I said, where is the mayor? He said, he left town last night. <laughs> and uh, uh, on this recent trip with when the photographs were exhibited in Wren, I met the mayor who is now a woman socialist, a delightful person who gave a reception for several hundred people in the town hall to celebrate the fact of, of the exhibition there. It was, it was great fun. Anyway, that's Let the only Let me show you the image then. I, I, I should, can I do that? Yes. Sure. Here we go. So this is the desk. I can't, you can't see to, it with the lights, but. Uh, you have to turn the lights off but just uh, to see it. But that's, just turn the lights off for a second? Just, is that just, possible? There. That's the mayor's desk. It's the same desk today. <laughs> And that's uh, the man who actually became mayor. Uh, he, he was just. Um, yes, a, he was appointed as a man. He would stay on for many years, for 20 years, as the mayor. Yes. Uh, and this is rather interesting. That, that's a resistant, uh, I mean, a, 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 probably a prostitute who is being hauled into a police station. And you can see the emotion engendered. See, that woman on the left is, is actually spitting at her. Uh, there, were, there were very strong feelings that day. But anyway, I'd be happy to answer your questions. If, if we can turn on the lights, I'd like to see the people I'm, who are asking and questions. If needed, if you bring up a picture you want to show, we'll be able to put it up on the screen. It might take a few seconds, but we'll be able to do that. Um, so what does it feel like being a photographer, recognized, highly acclaimed? I can't get used to being being called a photographer. <laughs> you know, when you have the privilege of working with the greatest photographers of the 20th century, which is, is what I enjoyed, uh, you don't call yourself a photographer when you're walking along the, down the street with Ernst Haas or Gene Smith or uh, Cartier-Bresson. Cartier uh, so I, I, don't, I, I still don't think of myself as a but I must admit the pictures are better than I thought they were. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Um, I just wondered if most of the correspondents had drawings, or we, did they use Lycus as well? Um, Kappa used uh, contacts mostly. Um, I'm basically a 35 millimeter man, I mean, and, uh, I, uh, and and that was another reason that I underestimated uh, those pictures because I'm not I'm I'm not normally happy with square format, uh, and I I'm I've, I've been very much uh, influenced by Cartier Bresson. Uh, I love editing. I always used to love editing his contacts with him. It was always fun to to do that, and, and I, I could usually pick out the same, same frame that he picked out on, on a 30, I, I, he was a very critical editor of his own work. Um, it's interesting, some photographers are good editors of their own work and others are terrible. Um, <laughs> yes? Wait, if you don't mind, just wait, wait for the microphone, it does help. Um, the, the Kappa on, when going in on D-Day, and the disaster with his pictures that he took that day when they were uh, yeah. uh, badly processed, did you speak to him about that at all? I mean, how did he feel? Okay. <laughs> this is, is there's, there's a new development here. Uh, for years, 
Uh, I have told the story of what happened on the night of June 7th at the Life Office on Dean Street. Um, it finally, uh, early in the evening, a, a packet of film came. Uh, D, mind you, D-Day, uh, the pictures were taken t early Tuesday, and they didn't reach, uh, reach the Life Office until Wednesday evening. And our, our absolute deadline for getting original negatives to New York was a shipment that left Grosvenor Square, that would leave Grosvenor Square at 9 a.m. on Thursday. That was the only way we could make the, the life Saturday at, at night closing with original prints. So we were, in, in addition, we were part of the four-way pool with the three wire services. And those guys were demanding, you know, uh, they were, everybody was, was, was frustrated because there had, there were just no pictures of this greatest military operation in history. So when Kappa's film finally came, there was a note saying, John, the, the, the action is all in the 35. I think he may, I'm, I'm not sure to this day whether he said four rolls of 35 or not, but there were four rolls of 35. So I ordered the contact prints for editing as fast as possible. In order to get, put pictures through censorship, in order to get them, the negatives sent back to America, we had to cut, cut up the, the contact uh, and, and, and write an individual caption for each, each frame. And we had to make four little proof prints about this big, five by seven, I guess, uh, of each picture that was, that was going to go through censorship. One print was, would stay in London, one would stay in the, in the London office, another in the, the London censors, one would stay in Washington, and the fourth would go to New York and the others with, with the, the negative. Anyway, it was a cumbersome procedure. So uh, we had a, 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 another shipment of film. Uh, from a, a, a pictures that Kappa had taken on the way across the channel, which was interesting background, and some of them were pretty good. And those had, I, had, I had already edited those, uh, but the, the four rolls of 35, which showed the landing on Omaha Beach, were the, were the critical ones. And in a few minutes, the darkroom lad, it was Dennis Banks, it wasn't Larry Burroughs, came rushing to my office saying, John, the films are ruined. He said, you, you were in such a hurry for prints. I put them in the, in the, in the locker to dry them, which was normal. But had, he said he had closed the doors and the emulsion had ran. He said, there's nothing on them. And I said, my God, I ran back to the darkroom with him and held up the three rolls and there was nothing on the, on the first three rolls. But on the fourth roll, there were 11 frames, and we printed every one. And it, ICP now has only 10 frames. I think, I think my recollection is that the 11th, the one, there was one picture that really wasn't, that was very marginal, and I don't blame anybody for having thrown it away. <laughs> but anyway, um, it now appears that, that it has been contested by Ross Bauman, a, a freelance photographer, that there's no such thing as the melting of the emulsion. And it now seems that very likely the three rolls were entirely blank. And my theory as to why Kappa uh, sent them back was there was such confusion on the beach. He, I think he had taken two rolls of 35 for each of his two contacts. They would probably, uh, in, in waterproof powder, uh, the, the reserve contacts was, on, uh, was probably on a waterproof uh, uh, sack. And, in the, and the, the, with all the noise of the shelling and the bombardment and people dying all around him, it's no wonder that, that Kappa, after shooting 11 frames, jumped on a landing craft and pulled out to see with, with people who were wounded and dying. Uh, so he just, 
he bundled all the 35 together. He, he probably didn't even know which role was, he had shot. And I think that's perhaps the reason now that that, that, and, and, that there was nothing on three rolls. So anyway, it's, believe it or not, a, a, a New York critic named A.D. Coleman has been making a big point about this, saying that he's, he implies that I've been lying for all these years. Well, I, I simply told, I t told the story of what happened that night. I told it to Kappa. He believed it. He, people always ask me, what did Kappa say to you after it? Well, he, he, knew I, 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 he knew I did the best job I could. Uh, he wrote home to his mother's. He, he believed that, uh, what, what Dennis Banks had said, which I told him, Dennis Banks had said, that the emotion ran. But Kappa didn't, he wrote, he, he said that and slightly out of focus was the semi-fictional account that he wrote of the D-Day landing. So that's the story of the, of, of the, of the, of the four roles. Yes. What did you learn about the young German who um, you wrote about in that article? I, I've never learned anything about him. I just saw. I, I just I had an emotional reaction when I saw his face. You know, my, my God, this is a, it, this guy might have been the one who. I was shot at personally twice. <laughs> Uh, there's a picture, you saw the picture that was actually taken under machine gun fire of three soldiers cr crouched uh, behind a stone wall. Well, we were all crouched because there was machine gun fire over us. And, um, but I asked the soldier, the GI in the middle, where the firing was coming from in, in a sort of a lull, and he said, I'll show you. He took me inland and, cr and crossed the street and, uh, and they told me to come in. And when I ran across the street, there was a shot. And I dropped down behind a, a stone wall in the opposite corner with him. He said, it's funny, that never happened the last time I came over. I said, yeah. I said, yeah, pretty funny. And he said, well, you'll have to run for it when we go back. So he ran back, and then I ran back. There was another shot, but the guy missed twice. But I thought to myself that this kid who was brought in as a prisoner half an hour later could have been the one that, who, sh who shot at me. Uh, it's, it's a privilege to be shot at and missed. Yes? We have got several questions. Um, thank you, John. I, I, it's been a really great evening, and I know that you've worked with some great, great people, and you've taken some great photographs as well. Uh, you know, why, um, why a Rolleiflex, that square format, and why didn't you continue taking photographs? Because my job was being a picture editor. I, I'm, as a picture editor, my job was either to assist photographers or to boss them around. <laughs> not, to, not, to, not, to, not to compete with them. And as far as the square, it was the easy, easiest. It's, it's just a camera I, I happened to borrow. I, I, I'm not, I don't, don't even remember where I got it. I got it. It may have been it may have been Coppa's Rolleiflex. He had a Rolleiflex, but I don't I, I don't I don't remember. Uh, he 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 had already left town by the time I borrowed the camera. Uh, he he wasn't in, I mean he was off in Normandy, and so I I had gotten that the Rolly from the London office. Yes. Hi there. Yes, that extraordinary image of the girl, the collaborator, the prostitute, we don't know who she was. Do you remember anything else once she left the frame? What happened to her? I'm just wondering about the rest of that right. story that we see there in the okay. um, She, I heard this commotion in the street, and, and uh, she was being uh, escorted in, into the police station. And I followed them. I followed them in, but it was so dark that without flash, I couldn't. I couldn't shoot a picture. That, that's what happened, and I, I lost track of her. She was, she was taken into police custody, but I. I that was the last. The I, I couldn't photograph her again. That's only. That was just the one frame. Hi there. Um. I was just wondering if your 
very short period of time as a photographer uh, influenced your editing later on? I don't think so, particularly. Uh, it, it's something that's it's interesting. I mean, it's, it's, it's obvious that I was a tight shooter. I, I shot only two or three frames at, at, at yeah, most we, yes. on, on any one of the, my, my 50, of the 50 pictures in the book. And uh, as you know, that's an, that's an unusually high ratio of, of usable pictures. <laughs> uh, by the way, I wish when you're, when you're speaking up that you would identify yourselves. I'd I, I like to know who's, who's asking me questions. Hi, uh, my name is John D. McHugh, and um, I've done some photography as well. Um, I, I spent a lot of time in Afghanistan and worked within the rules that were very difficult to, to get around in Afghanistan. One night a few years ago, I spoke to Horst Foss here, and we talked about his time in Vietnam, and he told me about how many bottles of whiskey it took to wriggle around the rules that they had. Could you tell us a little bit about how much wriggling was required to get past the censors and get the pictures out that, and, and the stories out that you wanted to get out? How much what? How much wriggling or negotiating or bending of the rules there was? With the censors? To get things through the, through the censors? Um, censorship, mostly, quite frankly, in World War II, occurred at the, at the, at the level of shooting. Photographers knew what not to shoot. Uh, they knew that if they photographed the faces of, the, of dead Americans or allies, the pictures wouldn't shoot, so they didn't shoot them. Uh, as John Steinbeck said, uh, it, is in, it is in the things not said that the untruth lies. Uh, the censors really didn't have that much to do. Uh, they looked for secret weapons. There were very few of those, and, and the only real big case that I know of was the, the Norden bomb, bomb site, which was accidentally uh, released as a picture. Not, not in Europe, as I recall. Um, one classic example of censorship uh, was I received in London a packet of pictures from Stockholm, from the time correspondent in Stockholm. Sweden was a neutral country. And he had, he had received a, a packet of pictures showing the effects of Allied air raids in Berlin, which were really gruesome. Uh, there were pictures of, of stacks of bodies in a gym, gymnasium. And uh, I, I got these uh, uh, through a contact at the, at the American Embassy in London. And I, I decided to try to send them back to New York. So I took them to the censors. And the censor looked at them. I've forgotten whether he, he was either a Brit or a Canadian, I'm not sure. And he said, these are very interesting. After looking at them all, he said, you may have them back after the war. Uh, so, um, but very little was actually uh, censored, if you want to know the truth. Uh, even, even, even the letters I wrote to my wife went through censorship. And of all the letters I wrote, I think I have only one or two that have a little, that were, that have this, uh, done, yeah, yeah, stuff cut out. Over there in the back, then you. Hi, um, Angus McSwan from Reuters. John, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I was just wondering what you thought of the condition of the people as you were driving around uh, Normandy and Brittany at that time. Was it a completely destitute and traumatized people, or had kind of life basically gone on as always, under occupation, but always a bit of sausage and wine, whatever? Yeah. This was the thing that interested me the most. I mean, here were people, here was the French. Ordinary French people had been subjected to terrible attack, aerial bombardment, coastal bombardment. Uh, I think the figure of, of French civilians killed in Normandy is something like 20,000 or something like that. Well, the figures are, yes, yeah, 20, 20 to 40,000 people yeah, yeah. were killed in and you, you, and friendly fire. 
And despite that, we were welcomed as liberators. I mean, uh, it, was, it was my book, one reason this book is doing well in France is that it's, it's a testament to, to, the, to the French people. It's, it's a love letter to France in a sense. And um, I'm very, very proud of that. On the other hand, I, I, I share the, the dismay of, of my, my generation and my colleagues with the present state, state of world affairs. I, I'm a peacenik from way back. In my senior year at college in 1937, when I published a picture by Robert Kappa in this magazine I was editing, I published it in, in October 1937. I published a photograph by Robert Kappa. I didn't know it was his picture. It was a picture of a Spanish loyalist uh, lined up. I'd gotten it from the Spanish consulate in Chicago. But my point is that my generation is bitterly disappointed in what has happened. Uh, we not only we finished World War II, that should have been the end. Uh, World War I, which who, uh, should have been the end. Woodrow Wilson predicted in 1918, when he was trying to get the Treaty of Versailles ratified in the United States Senate, that there would be another world war within a generation if the United States did not join the League of Nations. And he was right. So Kappa and I both quit life after the war. He quit to have an affair with Ingrid Bergman and go to Hollywood, which didn't work out. I quit to become a picture editor of Ladies Home Journal. <laughs> but we both <coughs> hoped that, that that war was the end. Kappa introduced me to a group of writers, including Arthur Miller and, and several uh, prominent editors, uh, Bill Shirer, uh, and others in New York who met regularly on Mondays to try to stop the Cold War. Uh, Jack Goodman, who was the executive editor of Simon & Schuster, was called upon to testify before Congress. He got in trouble with McCarthy. Uh, America, in effect, went to hell after World War II. There should never have been a war in Korea. There should never have been a war in Vietnam. We, 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 we killed off millions of people needlessly. It's not a, it's not a pretty record that America, and, and England too, is unfortunately. So I'm, 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 I'm not bitter, but I'm disappointed in, in, in what has happened in the world. I, I'm, I worry about my country. I'm still proud to be an American. But I, I, I'm disturbed. I, I, the, the recent American election just last week was a disaster. Uh, and I'm, so, I'm sorry to have to say that. John, jo Joshua Millet, and um, freelance photographer in, in London for 30 years. I loved your uh, talk and, and the pictures of your, of your book, and especially the one of you documenting Robert Ka Kappa, documenting the liberation, and uh, just uh, of a shot of him, of the back of him. Yeah. And, um, and I just wondered what that felt like to be an editor and then also a documenting uh, uh, the liberation at the same time and documenting one of your uh, photographers doing his job. And um, yeah. yes, and, and what that, and, and, and if that inspired you to, to continue photographing or, or what, the, what, what your feelings were behind taking that image. Well, <laughs> thank you for asking that. Um, I, um, it's very hard to get a, a good photograph of a photojournalist working. Uh, to get the, the picture that's on the cover of my book called Get the Picture, uh, it was just a fluke. We got a picture, a very good picture of Jim Noctway, who, is, who uh, was in action in 1940, 1994 in the South African elections which had turned violent. And Jim is, 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 was photographed by David Turnley. The other Turnley 
Peter was also there, but it was a, a it was a very tense situation. There's somebody here tonight uh, from Reuters who was there, where, uh, back there, who was also there that day. I just discovered that. Anyway, uh, it's it's hard to, to get pictures of photographers. Uh, life used to every week, life featured in a box about this big, uh, a, a, a photographer of the week. It wasn't, and not, not to be confused with the picture of the week, but a photographer of the week who, who had something, in, it could have been a picture, a news picture, it could have been a photo essay. Uh, and uh, the, the first thing I ever had to write that was published in life was, was, a, was, uh, was, was a, a, a thing like this about Cecil Beaton whom I interviewed, I, I mean, I, I wrote it in New York, but I, I, I did meet Beaton in, in London during the war. But um, anyway, uh, to answer your question, which is what got me started, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's hard to find good pictures of, of photographers really working. And you did not become a photographer. Right. <laughs> that, you know, it, it, he was not inspired by his photography to pursue uh, being a photographer, but was of course. I didn't. I just didn't think it was my place. Yes. Yeah. It, it, it was quite amazing because when we started working on this project, we didn't start working on it. We spoke about it, and John never believed this could happen because he he never took his images seriously as photographs. He took them seriously as notes taken along the way of things to remember, That's right. but n not as photographs. He was not trying to produce photographs. He was taking pictures like you jot down uh, you know, bits and pieces of information in a notebook. So it's a very different state of mind. The fact is and let me tell you this story, which was quite incredible. Uh, a couple of years ago, when the show was on in um, in Perpignan at Visa pour l'image, this festival of photojournalism in France, um, there were 30 images lined up on a wall, and it was a great year. It was um, it was a Don McCullen year. There was a huge retrospective, the biggest show they had ever had in Perpignan. On and that was there. and John was right there next to Don McCullen. Don McCullen is a well-known war photographer, established photographer, but it was. and John Marsh, who knows Don McCullen well, was I think quite flattered also to be so close to to him in this uh, festival. And, and Duncan, and that's what I'm getting to. And there, a panel was put together. Uh, that included uh, John Myers as a picture editor and a photographer, in this case, Don McCullen, David Douglas Duncan, who's also a pretty well-known war photographer for his images from the Korean War and Vietnam, um, Yuri Kuzirev, a Russian photographer who's covered much in the Middle East uh, in the last 10 years, and um, Chauvel, Patrick Chauvel, a French photographer, rather daring uh, character. So that was a panel, an amazing uh, panel. 1,200 people came uh, and listened to these great wise people. And, um, and uh, John was sitting next to David Douglas Duncan. They've known each other forever. They're the same age. They worked at Life magazine. They've known each other. They've often quibbled because they don't agree on everything politically, etc. And they actually were sitting side by side and uh, and feuding a little bit uh, when John said, "Well, I'm one of the oldest people here." Duncan said, "No, no, no. I'm ten months older than you are." <laughs> you know, this kind of uh, it was it was it was cute actually. You know, kindergarten stuff. Uh, <laughs> and and at one stage. Duncan said, look, I have to make a statement here publicly, and I have to tell you something, John. And I saw John you know, tighten up and say, my God, 
what kind of sledgehammer is he going to use this time, or something like this. I'm not sure what, what you thought exactly, but something of like that kind. And Duncan became very, very serious and said, you know, this morning I went and looked at your pictures. I went to see your exhibition, and I looked very carefully at every single image. And they come up with this conclusion that in reality, I think, you are a much better photographer than Robert Kappa ever was. <laughs> <laughs> Silence. In the, everybody was stuck. John didn't, didn't know what to say and what to respond to this. But he was so sincere. He said that he was not a war photographer. He was not an action photographer. He was a, a very fine, subtle observer of the reality of war in uh, a very dramatic uh, environment, which is what, um, of course, Normandy and Brittany were uh, you know, in the weeks following D-Day. So I think that is maybe the first time, and Don McCullen added uh, a few other compliments, and everybody did, but I think John really realized for the first time that there was indeed something to his photographs. But, you know, that's, uh, that's it. He never took any pictures after that. I'd like to say something about this man. I, I first met him. <laughs> uh, a a sledgehammer? <laughs> I, I think we met about 45 years ago. I was, to, yes. I was on the New York Times. I remember going skating in Central Park with you and your family. My and son, I yeah. taught your, uh, your son, uh, it was Taught just him. learning to skate, yeah. and I was a better skater than he was, and that, no that's, all, that's the only contribution I think I ever made to your family. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, if it hadn't been for Bob, there wouldn't have been an exhibition, there wouldn't have been this book. I, I am, shall be uh, eternally grateful. Well, uh, I need to, there, there's something, uh, we share quite a few things. I'm also a picture that I've never taken pictures. <laughs> Actually, one day, somebody, Jean-Luc Monterousseau, said to, to me, the, he's the director of the Maison Européenne de la Photographie in Paris, and said, oh, I, I hear that you're doing this book uh, with uh, John Morris and these unknown pictures of his. I said, yes. He said, well, you know, I would really like to do one day something with your own pictures. <laughs> I said, but I don't have any. He said, no, 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 that's not true. You're probably like John Myers. You have a, I said, no, I never took any pictures either. So that would be totally impossible. But, uh, <laughs> uh, no, but there are a number of things. I mean, we've known each other for a very long time. But uh, there, there's more to it than that. We actually could have met in 1943, 1944, because I was a couple of years old. I was born in London. I was living in London. I'm a South London boy. You, most people. <laughs> wouldn't believe it, but it's true. English father, French mother, and uh, so our paths have crossed. We've lived in the same cities, London, Paris, New York, uh, not at the same time and not in the same order. So there is much uh, that we have in common. We know many uh, photographers, great photographers, and have many of the same interests. For And that's why when I saw these pictures, for me, it was there was something very personal about it too, because it was revisiting um, that period of time. I had heard my father, who had been in the Royal Air Force, my my my, my grandparents, who had been supporters of De Gaulle in the early years. It's, it, that that sort of um, was part of my own youth, and as Don McCullen would say, the things that you know, we were shaped by war, like John was. So. There's much in, in common we had, and discovering this, this work, this incredibly small but powerful body of work, uh, was uh, something that um, I'm very grateful to John for, because he made those pictures, and uh, that's why I made the book. It's a, it's a two-way street, put it that way. Um, I'm sure there are some more questions. Uh, down there. Uh, yes, please. Hi, my name is Tom. I work here in London. I was just thinking, 
I wanted to know, seeing the picture of the young German boy is quite, it leaves an impression. Um, and also there's the, the young French boys with the rifles on the front. Was it common to see such young boys in war? Those boys on the cover were, had volunteered to, to be orderlies at the First Army press camp, which was in a chateau at, in Wuy in, in, in Normandy. They just turned up and, and they made our beds and things like that. And um, I, I had chatted with them and, and uh, uh, just, and I, think, I, I think that's the, the only, maybe the only frame of those three kids, I'm not sure. No, there, there were a couple of frames of them, but what is interesting about them is that two of them joined, joined the- uh, That's right, yeah the French forces, I guess, and they went all the way to Berlin. They, they were part of it. It's amazing that there were so many young people indeed, but we know on, on, uh, in Normandy, the day of the landing, there were, there were people who were probably 16, 17, who had lied at their age. I, I was watching something on television here yesterday. It, it's very clear that, um, that there, were, there were kids who went to war and uh, lied about their age to join the fight. Uh, and, and two of these kids actually did do that. And the, the German kid, it's probably a different story. What happened is that at the end, uh, the Hitler sent every, every young male available to the Western Front to try. And, and uh, in some of the other photographs, uh, you, you see that the, um, the prisoners are incredibly young, 17, 18, 19 years of age. Um, yeah. Kids do get involved uh, younger than they should in these yeah. terrible situations. My own, I, I'm sorry, no, go ahead. No, no, you. <laughs> right, um, John Lee Anderson with the New Yorker magazine. Um, yes. My God, great. Salute. Salute. <laughs> Salute. I, we um, know the man. We, we, we look at your images and I think we, you know, we all feel the weight of history when we see these images of World War II, of these incredible moments. And, and for those of us who were born after the war, it's, uh, you know, I think there's a kind of cognitive dissonance. We, we're in awe of that period. And so um, I just wanted to know uh, from you, not as a photographer, but as you know, John Morris, who was there at that moment, were you as aware as we are today? It's, it's an odd question. You can't answer it, I suppose, in the, the way I'm asking it, but that it was great history at that moment. How did you feel? Were you in a, how do you feel when you look back on that time and how do you remember yourself then, living those moments? A very good question and a little tough to answer. Um, It, 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 I learned through observation, for example, uh, newspapers report shortages of food, shortages of clothing, shortages of shelter. But as a photographer, I had a camera around me, and I saw a, 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 a peasant looking at reading a bulletin board. He looked hungry. I gave him a, a lump of sugar from my, from my ration. It was little, you know, a little thing wrapped up in paper. And I saw him unwrap it, touch it to his tongue, and then wrap it up again. And my God, one lump of sugar was so precious. And this made a picture. I mean, it was, it's, not a, it's not a great picture, but uh, in fact, I have to, I have to caption it verbally, but I was, history can be observed on, 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 on various levels, and one of them is just the common level of, 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 of human re reactions to, to ordinary situations. Uh, as picture editor of Ladies Home Journal, I learned a new form of journalism, which was reporting on, on family life. and. We were once doing, a, Esther Bubbly was doing a story for the Ladies Home Journal 
we had a, a, a monthly series called How America Lives. It was a report on a different American family each, each month. It went on for years. And they were rich or poor, east or west, whatever. And I used to pay 1500 Cartier Bresson. Uh, I, I uh, was, was so different from Capo that I learned, I think I learned from both. I learned from Maury, I learned how important it is that a, that a picture concentrate, concentrate its message. But from Capo, I, I, I learned to look for the human message. Colin Jacobson, uh, retired picture editor, unlike you, John. Um, uh, I read recently a quote from the, the writer, Vicky Goldberg, talking about the influence of photography, and she said, words to the effect of, photography changes nothing, but spreads its influence everywhere. And I wondered how you uh, respond to that, or whether you agree with that. Uh, I, I'm afraid I have to agree the ch photography hasn't changed enough. Uh, it was always my hope, and I think this was, I think this was the hope of most of my colleagues. Uh, 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 to put it in the words that, uh, of Don McCullen, that photography would made a difference, and we've been disappointed that it hasn't made enough difference. But I, I tend to blame publishers and editors more for this than I do the photographers. Photographers can, first of all, photographers have to have to also pay attention to words. Uh, it was a very important thing when Wilson Hicks retired from life as the picture editor of life. Uh, he founded a conference in Miami called Words and Pictures, and and this is where the editors so large so so often fail. I think the New York Times today is doing a better job, far better job in pictures than it did when I was a picture editor. Uh, so I, I, have, I have hope for the future. On the other hand, I see all these publications going out of business, staffs being reduced, uh, reductions here and there, enormous reductions. So it's, 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 it's a very mixed picture. Have we got time for one more question? Hi, John. Ryan Scapiro, a filmmaker from New York. Um, my question is, did your time there and that experience change how you worked as a picture editor? Uh... I'm not sure that it did. Uh, I, I, I tell you, I, I was relieved to get back. It, uh, uh, Bob said something he said that, that my editors had, had in New York had encouraged me to go. They didn't want me to go. <laughs> they, 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 they wanted me to stick to my, my job in London. And, uh, what, but I, I went and do, the thing I did, that I risked was losing, uh, I, I, losing my family. I mean, I, uh, I joked with my wife. I wrote to her from London, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to Normandy. They say a man's a coward now to, to, to leave London for the front because this is because of the V1, V1. and V2. And uh, I wanted her to believe that because I, 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 my, my letters are full of reassurance to her. I was more worried about that than anything else. I wasn't worried about the reaction of my bosses. I defied my bosses. Did, or did the perspective give you something new when you came back? I, I don't think so. I mean, I, I don't know. I, it, it undoubtedly did, yes, uh, because I did, uh, I, I, I had, I had experienced war at, as, in terms of air raids in London. Uh, uh, but it, it's different, of course, when you're, you're, when you're out there getting, getting a, a, a little shot at. You never took pictures in London during the war, did you? 
Ašu ja džedom. No, no, but that, 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 that's the point. I mean, you were here for a couple of years before uh, E-Day, and you had access to a camera, did not yeah. take pictures, that's a fact. But yeah. you did go to Normandy. And the fact is that these images of yours, though they're not that many, have a tremendous resonance today. I think what you were saying, the historical dimension, and it's perceived that way. I mean, the fact that we have been able to put three exhibitions together in Brittany alone, three different cities that heard about uh, the photographs and wanted to do a show. One very extraordinary one in Rennes, in particular, the capital of Brittany, where there were these huge enlargements on the main square. I was looking, I was trying to find some Im images of this. These gigantic prints, very beautiful prints in special enc casings with uh, two sides to them that we had sort of um, put on, on that main square uh, between the Opera House and uh, City Hall, where John took those pictures in 1944. That was extraordinary, and they were there for two months. Um, they were lit at night until one o'clock in the morning. I went there yeah, one this evening. Is, this is, this is not uh, they published this little brochure. Yeah, and this is, this this was published by the city of Rennes. I, I was very proud it's, about it. It's just amazing how his pictures have had this sort of impact. The exhibition will open in May of next year, um, and at the time of you know the end of World War II, uh, 8th of May, 1945, and it, the, the, the exhibition will be on for five months at the Museum of the Battle of Normandy in Bayeux, all the way up to the War Correspondence Awards that take place there every year. This is highly symbolic. Uh, we are invited in June, and I haven't had a chance to tell you really, to go to Budapest, where your exhibition will be presented in full. And we're invited to go and do a conversation. He had an exhibition in Luxembourg recently, one in uh, at the International Center of Photography. I mean, there is something. If, if, if people react to it and invite these photographs to be shown, it's that they indeed do have something. They do convey something. They have a dimension that goes beyond what we've already seen. Tell me about China. Oh, oh no, sure. <laughs> Next Monday I'm going to China to present the exhibition in <laughs> China. The, the full exhibition, the 40 and some other images that will open in a festival, it will go to other places in China, and there's some serious discussion of the book being published in China, which I find so ironic when you think of it that it's been impossible to get this book published in the United States of America. It's been overnight success. Sorry? It's been overnight success. <laughs> <laughs> in China? No, the whole Oh, the whole Yes, not exactly overnight, no, but it, no, no, but it, 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 it's been something quite extraordinary. And, um, and John, well, and that's what I like about it, uh, didn't intend it to be that way. It was not one of his goals. It's something that was there, you know, that, that's, that's what's remarkable about it. And I think this show will go on. These pictures will be seen for a long time to come. And I'm, wor I'm working on a book which is tentatively called My Century. My Century began in, in 1916 and will end two years from now. And uh, I'm putting together a, a picture book of both personal and historic pictures uh, for a book which, if I live long enough, will be called My Century. And that would be a big one this time. <laughs> time for a time for a drink. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'd like to introduce you to my wife, who was a teenager living.